Today could possibly be a challenging message. The title of today's message is Standing in Faith. Standing in Faith. You might, we, we could say staying in faith. We could go further and add another scripture to it and saying being still in faith. I am staying, I am standing in faith. If you see the graphic that's up there on the screen, could you go back to the first one for me, the, the very first intro one with the, with the car on there? Perfect. The, the visual aid in these graphics is, is, and I give it to you here, is that much like you would drive to an intersection and you have choices in life and it's in those moments that you have a decision. Either I'm going to go forward or I'm going to go left or I'm going to go right or I'm going to stay put. I'm going to stand. I'm going to stay. I'm going to be still. And the guiding of your life, if you are the car, you know if you've been through some things and there's a level of maturity in your faith, there is absolutely seasons of standing, staying, and being still before God. And those being as powerful as anything that you would do right, left, or forward. So I'm going to challenge us today as we have gone now, this is our third week. The first week was fasting, which by the way, you would have completed your second week of fasting. And here we go into our third week, our headed towards 21 days next Sunday. So this is our third week that we're entering into right now. So the first week was fasting. Last week was hearing the voice of God. Today is standing in faith, standing with God, being still with God. Isaiah 28 and 16, your verse, verse there, it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. A sure foundation, a cornerstone for your life. The New Living says, Whoever believes need never be shaken. I'll just give these to you. They're not up there. Whoever believes need never be shaken. The one who relies on it, the foundation, will never be stricken with panic. I don't know if life has ever caused you to be stricken with panic that you feel like I must make a decision. I can't just sit here. I've got to do something. The Bible declares that a sure foundation, of course, this is the prophetic word from Isaiah about the coming Messiah, that he is the cornerstone. He is the stone that has been tried. He is the sure foundation. What's he saying? You have a foundation upon which you can build your life and be sure that it won't move. We sing a song, the rock won't move. That's what that means. Jesus is not moving. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I can count on Jesus. I may not be able to count on people, but I can count on Jesus. The Living Bible says, he who believes, talking about who, he who believes will not act hastily, it says in that translation, the, the, uh, the Living Bible says, he who believes need never run away. I like dipping in to different translations because there's been times in my life where I've wanted to quit, where I've wanted to run away. I would declare to you today that standing takes as much or more faith than doing something. Remaining still in the presence of, I'm talking to mature believers right now, standing still in the presence of the Almighty and allowing Him to fill you, equip you, pour into you, strengthen you, is a level and a depth of your faith walk that you need in every season of your life. So fasting, this season of fasting that we're in as a church, is a profound way to slow down and be still. And all the people who love carbs said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> we have not had bread in two weeks. Nay, a donut. <laughs> So what does this being still or standing, I have to give you this visual, what does this being still or standing in faith 
mean? Because I believe that there are people amongst the body of Christ that would say, well, I'm just waiting on the Lord. And, and th that vernacular could be right, but if the posture is wrong, their faith becomes very passive, and they're just declaring that if God wants me to have it, then he'll just drop it in my lap. Can I tell you that's not in the Bible? If you want it, you, you, the posture of your life is one that you are ready to go. So you, you get the visual image right now. If somebody was in a chair and, and, we, and we were grappling over this topic, the visual would be one person who slouched back in their chair with their arms crossed saying, I'm just waiting on the Lord, versus the person who's sitting in the identical type of chair who is up on the edge of their seat, toes forward, head forward, ready with anticipation. Now, they haven't moved just like the other person, but the posture is different. You could see somebody who's standing. In another example, where they're standing and they'd say, well, I'm just waiting on the Lord, and they could have their feet crossed. I've got to be careful. Get their feet crossed and their arms crossed, and this is still standing. Wouldn't you agree? But this looks a whole lot different in faith than somebody, come on football people, that would get over here in a three-point stance and say, if you tick, I'm getting ready to blow your head off. <laughs> now, that was football stuff, so everybody calm down. No one was hurt or violated during this <laughs> illustration. But this, if I got down, you couldn't see me if I got down there. In a three-point stance, we, we, would, we would be like, okay, they're getting ready to get out of the blocks if you ran track. They're getting ready to go. But the posture of their heart, the mindset of their spirit man is, I'm waiting for the sound of the Almighty. And when he gives me the go, because I'm not moving unless he tells me to move. We'll just stay right here until he tells me to go. Now, in the Old Testament, there's a story in 1 Samuel 13 of King Saul who had trouble waiting on the Lord. You may have re read this story and remember it. Saul was a king of Israel. He was the appointed and anointed king, but he was up against an imminent adversary, the Philistines. The Philistines were coming. He knew it, and God sent Samuel the prophet to his house or to the castle to say, yep, they're coming. And yep, they do want to do you harm. And Saul was, you know, what, well, what do we do? And Samuel had a word from the Lord, and the word of the Lord was, go to the temple, go to the house of God, and get this, wait for seven days. Sounds a little bit like Jericho. Right? I'm going to have you walk six times, the seventh time. I want you to wait for seven days. And when I come, the prophet Samuel said, I will give an offering, I will give a sacrificial offering to the Lord in the temple. And at that time, you, we will leave out of the temple from the place of worship, don't miss it, from a place of consecration, from a place of sacrifice. From there, we will go out into battle. And that is when the Lord will give you the victory. That's a pretty sweet plan. I don't know who's on your team, but I got God, the maker of heaven and earth, on my bench. And let's just see when we tussle who's going to win. I mean, that would feel really good, right? Word of the Lord comes to your house and says, wait seven days, and then let's go. I mean, who, could, who in the world could mess that up? Well, let's read in the Bible. 1 Samuel 13 and verse 8 says, Saul waited there seven days for Samuel, as Samuel had instructed him earlier, but Samuel still didn't come. Saul realized that his troops were rapidly slipping away, so he demanded, bring me. Bring me the burnt offering and the peace offering. And Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. Verse 10, just as Saul was finishing with the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. Isn't that interesting? Saul, Saul went out to meet and welcome him, but Samuel said, What is this that you have done? Saul replied, I saw my men scattering from me. Now notice we didn't answer the question directly. I don't know if you've ever been in trouble with the principal <laughs> or your mom and dad. Or a boss or somebody else but when you when you've been caught in something we try to deflect I see that you're late well it's snowing outside uh, no it's 75 and sunny we try to deflect a little razzle-dazzle right throw off something get them distracted and watch here 
Saul saying, I saw my men scattering from me, and you didn't arrive when you said you would. And the Philistines are at Michmash ready to battle. They're ready to mash him is what they're ready to mash. So I said, the Philistines are ready to march against us at Gilgal, and I haven't even asked uh, for the Lord's help. So I felt compelled. I'm sure you did, Saul. To offer the burnt offering myself before you came. Verse 13, how foolish Samuel explained. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. Verse 14, but now your kingdom must end for the Lord has sought a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him. This was King David. He was talking about David. To be leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a significant implications of power and strength and possibilities when you wait on the Lord. When you move forward in your flesh and you move forward in your natural senses and your natural understandings, you find out real quick, I get into a lot of trouble that I probably shouldn't have gotten in. God didn't design me to walk through this desert or this trial. But when I stand with God and I go through a storm or a desert or a trial, his promise is, Emmanuel, I, he is God with us. He will walk us through. But when we get outside of the covering of God's plan, will, and purpose for our life, we run into all kinds of mess. Nobody in that moment should be pulling out what God told me. I mean, there, there were slivers of truth in Saul's story about what he was saying. Yep, your men were running away. Yep, Saul didn't show up exactly, or Samuel didn't show up exactly when he said he was going to. But there was a stretch in his faith. Will you listen to the word of the Lord? I wonder what is just on the other side of our obedience. I wonder what is just on the other side of the length of our patience. The fruit of the Spirit, long-suffering. I wonder what would happen in the workplace or with a family member where we uh, harvest the fruit of the Spirit, long-suffering, in that relational situation. I wonder what God could do there if we would just wait on Him. He hadn't said nothing else. He said just love them, care for them, be with them, take care of them, love them, care for them, be with them. That's all He said to do. But when we get into the natural, when we get into the flesh and we start devising themes, like for some reason now this is costing me more money than I thought it should cost me money and so we'll start rationalizing our way with God Lord don't you know I mean this is the one with the cattle on a thousand hills that made heaven and earth and put the stars in the sky and we're talking to him because something cost us a little extra money during the month standing in faith has powerful implications Abram and Sarah had a plan and a word from God. Now they had to wait a long time, but they didn't. They 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 grew frustrated in waiting for the Lord. And what did they do? They birthed an Ishmael. Which, if you follow the lineage of Ishmael, you find out they 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 for all time have been the adversary of God's people. I'll, I'll summarize a lot of history for you with that one statement. Ishmael came out of impatience. So there are benefits to standing. In faith, I'm bringing you five of them today, five benefits to standing in faith. And I believe, church, I want you to hear me, I believe that if you attach yourself to at least one of these, maybe, maybe it'll be all five, as I've talked to you, because we're, we're really dedicating this first 21 days to the Lord in this series called Moments. I believe that if we can structure our moments with the Word of God, saturated, surrounded by every one of those moments, this will be the greatest year of, of our lives we've ever had, the greatest year of victory, the greatest year of blessing, the greatest year of God's hand in our life. Wouldn't that be amazing if you could say that come, come the end of the year? I believe you can. Five benefits. We find 
some very insightful language from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 as we look at these five. Now, I want to read this passage of Scripture now that you're ready to go. The, these five benefits, I'm going to pull them out of Ephesians chapter 6. And this passage of Scripture, if you've been in church for, for a little bit of time, you probably recognize it. There's been a lots of great books written. But let me give this to you here Rick, no, real quick. Verse 10 in Ephesians 6, it says, A final word. This is Paul speaking. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Verse 11, put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand. I want you to see these words as we go through them. If you've got a pen, it'll help you as we, as we, as we roll through. To help you stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore put on. Now I want you to see those two. That, that there's very descriptive and very instructional from a spiritual context. He keeps repeating the words put on. There's action here. In the middle of standing, in the middle of staying, in the middle of being still, there is action. So if you like to annotate, you can do that. Just, just circle put on. Verse 13, therefore put on every piece of God's armor so that you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Verse 14, stand your ground. Uh, one translation says stand, and when you've done all else, stand some more. <laughs> Keep standing. Stand your ground. Putting on, there it is again, the belt of truth and the armor of God's uh, the, the, ar the body armor of God's righteousness, that's the, blessed pl uh, the breastplate of righteousness, most of you have heard, verse 15. For shoes, put on some Chuck Taylors and some tube socks. No, what does he say? <laughs> For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these things, hold up, circle that one as well, hold, put on, hold up, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Verse 17, there it is again, put on, circle those, put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in prayers for all believers everywhere. Here we have very specific instructions for our faith in this posture of standing, being still, and staying. God takes it further and gives us a natural illustration of what we're supposed to wear. Have you ever asked someone who invited you to a party, what's the attire? What, what am I supposed to wear to this event or to this uh, gathering? God's telling us in our faith journey what we need to wear. These are, these are daily clothes. These are spiritual things that we must, he says over and over again, put on. So the first benefit that you receive, number one, the first benefit you receive from standing in faith is you remain in victory. Write those words there on the line. Remain in victory. And here's what you have to know, believer, son or daughter of the Most High. We stand in victory we're not fighting for victory. Victory has already been won. There's a whole, it looks a whole lot different, and the swagger that you have spirit, can is it okay to say in church? The swagger that you have spiritually when you stand in victory, we won the championship. What do you gotta come get it? Jesus has already come out of the tomb, gone to the pit of hell, taken the keys. Amen. And victory is ours. We don't, in any circumstance of our life, are grappling for victory. We remain when we stand in victory. You have to know that. If you've never heard that before, it, it, it's revolutionary to your faith when you read Scripture. These are all the things that Jesus did for me. Yep. Yep. That's the message of grace. I'm not spending my life running around trying to get victory. No, 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 no. I stand in victory. And here's what you have to know. The opposite of standing is moving. <laughs> and if I'm not standing in victory and I move outside of where God has me, then I'm out there on my own. But I'm going to stay right here. 
This is where Abby and I have talked about many times about how we want to be led by the peace of God. I preached on that a couple, a couple times now. The peace of God in our life is like we, we want to live in peace. It doesn't mean that the enemy won't come. The Bible declares if you resist the enemy, he will flee from you. Jesus was tempted three times, and the Bible declared that the, in, that the evil one left for the next opportune time. So this, this armor of God, this dressing up, this putting on, is a requirement of the faith for me to stand. Let's get ready. i got to get ready for the day. Give me a minute. i got to go get some clothes on. Amen? You remain in victory. So notice the putting on that he declares throughout the passage of Scripture. Paul takes it uh, even further in Ephesians 4. He, he gives you a little bit more if you read above Ephesians 6 where we were just at and you go to Ephesians 4, verse 21, it says this, And since you have heard about Jesus, this is for many of you in the room, since you have heard about Jesus and you've learned the truth that comes from him, verse 22, throw off the old sinful nature, your former way of life, which is corrupted by lusts and deceptions. I mean, he keeps repeating it. There's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. The enemy is trying to deceive and lure you away with the lusts of the natural man. Verse 23, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature. So earlier he said, throw off the old nature. Now he's saying, put on the new nature created to be like God, we studied that a few weeks ago, truly righteous and holy. So he's giving us this example of throwing off the old and putting on the new. you, you got to get this visual. You throw off the old and you put on the new. It's like get throwing off the old jacket and putting on the new jacket. I'm throwing off the shoes that used to take me to places of destruction and now I'm putting on the shoes of peace. This is in your spirit, man. It's easier for us to picture it in the natural man, but this is our spirit man. We're, we're throwing off the old and putting on the new. God's got something new for us to wear. What does he have us new to wear? Who we are in Christ. We literally put on the promises of God in our life every single day. The Bible declares you work out your salvation daily with fear and trembling. He's asking you to have good hygiene. It's going to come in a minute. He, he's asking you, pl please make sure you change your garments. Please make sure as you go into today that you take off yesterday's dirt. Because if you've lived life a little bit and you're, you know, you're a boy, and there will be some kinds of oils and things that will be accumulated on the clothing that you wear that will create a funk that nobody wants to be around you. So what he's really saying is, can you please take a shower? And the Bible declares you can be washed in the water of the word. I'm giving you all scripture, and I'm trying to help you right now. You can be washed in the water of the word. He's saying, honey, get back in there and wash your hair with soap. It doesn't count. This is, this is my house a little bit. It doesn't count unless you use soap. <laughs> you have to use, get back in there and shower the entire body. <laughs> and scripture declares, put off the old and put on the new. Take off the old funky rags and put on the new royalty of who you are in Christ Jesus. That you are a priest. Amen. And you are a king in the kingdom. You have some kingly and some priestly garments to put on. What are those? Those are who you are in Christ Jesus. Now, I'll tell you right now, if you're, if you're in this fast and you're struggling, what do I do next? I will tell you, go grab a scripture that speaks to your spirit man and attach your spirit to that scripture, to that garment of clothing. And keep putting on that garment every single day. You guys know you like a certain pair of pants or a certain shoe or a certain jacket that you just love to wear. It's like, whoo, baby, you wore that, you know, you know, every day this week. 
Well, I like it. It feels good. It's comfortable. Can I tell you that you need scriptures in your life the same way? Get that scripture that speaks to you in this season. You know, seasons change. And the coat you wear in the winter is not the coat you wear in spring. And sometimes you don't even need that coat in the summer. There's be certain seasons you won't need that scripture. But in some seasons you'll need that scripture. You might need to go get a whole new wardrobe depending on how bad the storm is. Well, I've never had gloves before. I've never done that before. I've never had to buy boots before. I've never seen this before. I've never seen a storm come against me like this. The Bible declares that I'm going to stand and then keep on standing. But I've never had shoes like that before. I've never had a coat. I may have to go get some more scripture, some more clothes for that. I may have to dress in layers today. Take off the old and put on the new. Some of you, I'm going to challenge you that have been in church a long time. You've been reading and quoting the same scriptures. It's time to break up and get us some new scriptures. You want to go to new levels, it's time to get some new clothes. I mean, if you're ready to run with the Lord, it's time, baby, to go get some running shoes. Come on, hear me now. Romans 13 and 14 says, Instead, clothe yourselves with the presence. Hmm. Clothe, your, clothe yourself with the presence of of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't and do not let yourself think about things or ways to indulge your evil desires wow that's the old man and that's the new man nope I used to wear that it'll come up in your mind it'll, it'll come up in your in your soulish man there'll be there'll be something drawing you to a certain appetite and you'll say you know what that that's an indulgent uh, an indulgence of the evil that I used to be in my life now I'm gonna go put this on and you have that scripture prepared if any man be in Christ he's a new creator creation the old things have passed away behold all things have become new 2 Timothy 1.7 He has not given me a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I don't have to panic. I don't have to run away. Jesus is my sure foundation. He is the rock of ages, the Bible declares. This is where I'm going to stand. So number one, <laughs> you remain in victory. Number two, number two, you're strengthened for every season. Ephesians 6 and 13 again says, therefore put on, you can circle that, put on every piece of God's armor so that you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you, <laughs> you will still be standing firm. Isn't that interesting? That if I put on the whole armor, that I'll still be standing firm. James 4 and 7 in the Amplified Remember, it pulls out some things from several concordances that help us in our understanding with the Amplified, and it says this. So submit to, and then it adds the authority of God. Submit to God, resist the devil, and it, it describes here, stand firm against him. How, how do I resist the devil? I, am I going after him in the offense? Nope, I'm just standing right here. I don't know if you recognized or not, but the armor of God is only for the front of your body. Shoes prepared, we'll get to them in a minute. The belt, the breastplate, the helmet, the sword of the spirit, right? It's all in the front. There's nothing in, and there's nothing behind. What does that mean? I'm constantly resisting the enemy with the word of God. And I'm going to help you with this in a minute. But I'm con he's coming at me and I'm not moved. I stand on the rock of ages. My foundation is sure. I resist him when that stuff comes. I resist him with this wardrobe. There's no reason to turn my back. In fact, if I turn my back, you can finish the story. But His grace is sufficient. Even if we run, He's just one step right behind us. We turn around. You can run a thousand steps away from God. Away, but He's one step away. You turn right back around and there He is. Stand firm against him and he will flee from you. Standing firm and resisting the enemy requires something of us, ladies and gentlemen. We cannot spend the majority of our time thinking it with our minds and our hearts about all of our problems, about all of our shortfalls, about all of our flaws, about our damaged past and how now we are damaged goods. Or some of you would say, well, I guess I have a temper. My dad had a temper and his dad had a temper, so I guess I had a temper. I will tell you right now, that kind of thinking does not 
resist the enemy. In fact, that gives the enemy places to come in, to flood your life, to give a foothold for the enemy, to start creating havoc in your life. You, that, that's the old man that's talking. The old man, the natural man says, well, I had a disposition within my family that did this. I appreciate the disposition in the family. You have to manage that in the earthly context that you do live in a suit. And so you need to take care of that. For somebody like me, I have a propensity toward high blood pressure. I don't know why that would ever be the case. And the doctor said, did you got to take this little teeny tiny pill? And I said, what on earth could that little teeny tiny pill do for me? <laughs> well, through a little bit of trial and error, it turns out the little pill's helpful. <laughs> so we're going to keep taking it. And I'm believing God that I'm getting off of it. So I said, all right, I see, I see you, I see you, doc, I see you five, I'm going to raise you five. I'm going to get after this thing in the gymnasium, and I'm going to come back, and that blood pressure is going to be too low, you're going to take me off of it, and I'm going to say, see, told you. Amen. He didn't like that, but we're still friends. <laughs> there is a proper way, ho hopefully you're getting, I try, don't, I try not to do too many shenanigans so that you can actually hear scripture and hear the truth. So hopefully you're, you're catching this right now. There is a proper way to get ready in the mornings. There is a proper way that God wants you to put on the new and not the old. In the same way that most adults have come up with a routine that helps them make sure before they leave the house that they in fact have their pants on. Because there will be some mornings where you struggle, and if you break the routine, you will forget your purse or your keys or your phone. Somebody, everybody's looking, oh, that couldn't be me. Uh -uh, I don't know what that's about. You leave your computer, you leave your briefcase, you walk out to the car, you have no keys. <laughs> it's snowing, there is no jacket. When you break the routine, you forget stuff. But if you have a routine that you do every morning or most mornings, you know where you put things and hang stuff up and you, you, know, you can be half awake and you can still get through and get there and you, you get to work and you're like, I don't even remember driving. Who, who got me here? And it will become so much of a routine that you get ready and you get ready pretty well. How about spiritually we do the same thing? How about we develop patterns and routines in our life that ensure that we are dressed and ready for the day? What does that mean? Well, while you're doing certain things, you can double that up with making sure you're getting scripture in your, in your spirit, man. Making sure that you are putting on these things and putting off the old. You may have to put some worship music on or, 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 or somebody who's preaching in the background who, who's giving you scripture. There are CDs that are out there that just feed scripture to you while you're brushing your teeth and your mouth is all full of all that other stuff going on. You can be getting scripture in your head or when you go to work and ride the train or ride the car you can have something pumping and filling your spirit because you know baby I got to get dressed I cannot show up to work and not be dressed and ready to go amen so there are some routines that you have to develop in my kids lives we are working on the routine there has to be a process every day every day you have to brush your teeth if you want to be a good friend don't show up with dragon breath. We go over this every day. You want to be a good... Stop it. You want to be a good friend? Stop, stop it. I don't want to... You want to be a good friend? Go brush your teeth. Can you imagine if God would do that for us? Don't be showing up in here with no dragon breath. Don't be coming in here spitting all of that all over everybody. We don't want to hear about how bad this was and that. Show up with the joy of the Lord as your strength. Show up with some happiness and joy because he is your sure foundation. Let your spirit man be energized with the truth of his word that today is going to be a great day. He has not given me a spirit of fear. I maybe not see it all, but he has not. That is from the enemy. He has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound. I don't have to be crazy. He's given me a sound mind. Your friends may not know that, but he has given you a sound mind. You've got to create routine in your day. Colossians 3 and 8 says this, 
But now yourselves are to put off these things. So here we, here we are. We're putting off. This is us scrubbing away. You ready? Put off these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds, verse 10, and have put on the new man. It's all throughout the New Testament. Now that you've put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Renewed knowledge. Renewed understanding. How, how is it that I soap and clean every day? I renew my understanding. I renew the knowledge that's within me. It's wonderful to have a scripture be built in your spirit in one. This has happened to Abby and I, where we'll have a scripture built in our spirit man over the course of a year, and we're like, well, you know, amen, praise God, that's a good scripture, hallelujah, that's awesome. And, and we haven't had to pull that out quite yet. But then the next year shows up, and the Holy Spirit, we have a rumbling, and all of a sudden, together, we go, ah, that's, that's, and then we start declaring that scripture. Now, that piece of clothing, I see why God wove that into my life so that in this season, I would be prepared with that garment. <laughs> Strengthened for every season. Number three, the benefits, the benefits of standing. Number three is you are equipped for every battle. You are equipped. When I stand and stay still with the Lord, I am equipped for every battle. Ephesians 6 and 14 says this. Stand your ground putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. The, bre the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15. For shoes put on peace. I like those shoes. Woo, look at those shoes. Look at you. Those bad shoes. Those are shoes of peace. <laughs> huh? I mean, for me, I, you know, sometimes you get revelation. You kind of get a little bit of, you know, a little attitude about it. Like, yep, these are nice shoes. <laughs> Don't step on my shoes. <laughs> the shoes of peace that comes from the good news so that you will be, there it is, you can circle it, underline it, and study it this week, fully prepared. You never have to wonder, in my standing, in my resisting the enemy, am I prepared for this? Am I, am I capable? Because I've heard people, when you go through certain seasons, you, you'll ask pastor or you'll ask your friends and you'll ask God, I'm not sure that I'm built for this. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm prepared for this. Am, am I competent to stand in this moment? Is this really what God would have for me? Well, the Bible declares that when you get dressed in the kingdom and you put on the belt of truth, you know, the belt of truth, it's, it's the center mass of your body. It kind of holds up everything around. You've got to have your belt on. The belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. What does the breastplate of righteousness, the body armor, come on guys, the body armor of God and His righteousness do for you? It ensures the most tender part, police officers and others would say this is critical mass. If we can injure them there, they would become wounded to a point that we could catch them. Can I declare to you that I need the breastplate of righteousness to cover my heart because the Bible declares that out of your heart flows the issues of your life. And if the breastplate of righteousness, you're going to get it in a minute, if the breastplate of righteousness is covering the most tender part of my life, how do I get the breastplate of righteousness? Well, we know from Scripture that my righteousness or my, don't miss it, my right standing comes from the cross. My ability to put on the breastplate and stand and resist the enemy has zero to do with how good I am or how good I remember scripture it's Jesus at Calvary when he spread his arms and those nails went through his hand the breastplate of righteousness went over the tender parts of my life and covered my heart and guarded me from the fiery darts of the enemy you see that the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. And man, you got them bad shoes on. I love it that he put the shoes in. I kind of have a thing for shoes. I may or may not have twice as many shoes as Abby, but we don't need to get into that right now. That's not a part of what we're talking about. There's no reason to be distracted with useless information. 
dude put shoes in the Bible. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> shoot, peaceful shoes. Now, this is interesting. These are the shoes that carry the good news of the gospel. Can I declare to you today that God did not say combat boots carry the gospel? Because I have friends that feel like for the ministry of the gospel to go forward in the earth that we need to take it with combat boots. Now, are there times to resist the enemy in greater measure on something and, and stand for righteousness and stand for equality? This is, this is Martin Luther King weekend, right? We stand. I, I ain't playing with that. <laughs> you can talk about whatever you want. We ain't playing with that, Right? There's times where we do that. When the gospel goes forward in its, in its greatest measure and its greatest fulfillment of what Christ intended, you find out that Jesus showed up with shoes of peace, forgiveness, understanding, the woman at the well, the murderer that was on the cross next to Jesus. He had compassion while he was hanging and, 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 and trying to grasp breath because he was sinking under his own weight. He was dying. He was suffocating. For you and I, there was the murderer that was on the cross that said, Lord, if you would remember me, he said, you will join me in paradise. The shoes that he dresses the gospel, you got to hear this. The shoes that he gives you to carry the gospel are shoes of peace. Somebody challenged me one day in a, in, a, in a lunch some time ago about how the gospel needs to go forth with, you know, with powerful truth. And I said, amen. And then I found out the greater subpoints of their plan for truth going forth was to really be combative. And I said, I'm just telling you right now in scripture. And so I gave them a little bit. And they still didn't want to hear it. But I know the truth is, is that the gospel goes forth in love. The gospel goes forth in peace. You, you, you can diffuse situations real quick with, with, with having a hand of friendship. Anybody that's out there, you know, beating up folks in the name of Christ is not the Bible. It's them bad shoes of peace. You can remember that. When you get dressed, you're like, man, I got my good shoes on today. <laughs> the gospel of peace. Colossians 3 and 5 says, so put to death the sinful. I'm going to help you now. Put to death the sinful. Oh, boy. Okay, i got to be done. Colossians 3, and are we doing okay? Yes. Colossians 3 and 5, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. My goodness, Paul. I mean, that is like, you know, tell me what you really think. Put to death the sinful earthly things lurking, ew, lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust. There it is again. And evil desires. Don't be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolater thing, worshiping the things of this world. Put to death those sinful things, those earthly things that are lurking. Pastor, how do we put those things to death? Those things continue to keep creeping up in my life, and I don't know how to resist those things. I feel like I'm resisting, and I'm declaring, and I'm decreeing, right? Those are church words. Declaring and decreeing and rebuking. I love those words. And we're getting after it, and how come those things keep, keep cropping up in me? Well, I would lead you back to uh, the office plants in your office to help you with this one. If you don't water the plant, it's going to die. Can we get somebody around here with some water and put water in the plants? This plate, they die. Isn't that interesting? If I don't feed it, if I don't water it, it'll die. Now, some weeds are a little bit more hardy than others. You might have to not feed it and put something on it. I'm helping you right now. Some of them, you just like, we're going to cut the water line off, and they still keep coming, and you're like, I'm getting ready to go get something stanky and put on you. <laughs> so here's the truth about putting away and killing these sinful things and these things lurking in the earthly man is stop feeding them. Stop it. Stop putting that into your spirit, man, through your eyes or whatever you're reading or whatever you're listening to or whatever you're giving your place. Stop it. I talked to a, to a dear brother the other day that was, that was he, he listens to great radio shows, but they get him worked up. They, the radio shows, they get him worked up, and he gets worked up, and when he gets to work, he's all worked up, and he's, Aah! and everyone's like, Woo! 
And he said, I, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, stop listening to that. So when you get to work, you carry the gospel with shoes of peace. There may be some things that you have to step away from because it's feeding, it's feeding your soul and your flesh in a way that's getting you all amped up. Stop it. <laughs> Hebrews declares, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, amen, that's the church, let us throw off, there it is again, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Wow. If you know that you can't go do that, then stop doing it. If you're serious about having a healthy, strong marriage and that thing gets you tripped up, then it says cast it off, throw it off, get it out of your life. If there's something that's entangling you in the workplace, get rid of it. If there's something that's distracting your time with God and, and a time to be with Him and it keeps pulling and luring you away, Hebrews says throw it off, cast it off, get rid of that thing. That weight, that sin that so easily ensnares you. Everybody in the room knows that one or two things that's high on your list that seems to constantly pull you away. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Because you are equipped for every battle. Number four. Number four, we'll move quickly now. Number four, the benefits of standing is being protected in the unknown. Being protected in the unknown. 2 Corinthians 2 and 7 in the Amplified says that we walk by faith and not by sight. And everybody said, Amen. Living our lives, it goes on to say, living our lives in a manner consistent with our confident belief in God's promises. Our ability to walk by faith or stand in faith and not by sight, not by our natural senses, is back to Isaiah 28, either I believe or I don't believe. And when I believe that Jesus is my sure foundation, I don't get freaked out, I don't get panicked, I don't feel like I have to quit and cut bait and run. Nope, I'm going to stand right here. I don't walk by sight, I walk by faith. My life is led by faith. I see that that's an issue, but I'm just going to stand right here on the sure foundation of Jesus. Jesus Christ, and I'm going to resist the enemy. Amen. Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, and He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So faith, without faith it's impossible to please God, and it goes on to say, anyone who comes to Him must believe, must have faith. Standing resolute in faith. I believe first and then I see it manifest. Faith is not present if you can see it. Now you'll see it in your spirit, man. That's where you always see it first. But if I can see the manifestation of it, I don't need faith. I'm believing God for a raise. I would prefer them just bring cash and put it on the table. That would really speed things along. <laughs> However, I have not met anyone that has been willing to do that yet. So, when God speaks to me about greater resources coming to my life and greater measure of stewardship, He will push me in the area of faith, believing Him at His word, that He has blessed me to be a blessing to my children. And my children's children, Proverbs says. You see that? <clears throat> Protected in the unknown. Faith lives outside of the known. Wow. Number five. You probably guessed it. What's the benefit of standing with God? Growing faith. You learn to stand and keep on standing. You watch your faith go to depths and heights and widths and capacity like never before. Where your faith gets expanded. Where you start believing God in ways that you never thought were possible. I've, I've given you the illustration before and I'm almost done. I've given you the illustration before that faith is much like, hear this now, faith is much like the headlights on your car. That God will let you see in the dark road of your life how far down the road as far as your lights will shine. Now, there are some people that have little faith. They just got their parking lights on. 
They're going down the road. They don't have the real headlights on. They just have parking lights on. All they can see is a few feet in front of them. They can see that, so that's as far as they will know something, and faith is, faith is beyond that. But then there's people that, whoo, their faith is way out there. We're talking like KC lights up top, you know what I mean? Like we got some serious bright lights that are shining down there. We got major faith. I can see that in the spirit, in the name. I can see the road. I can see where we're going. I can see a year ahead. You've heard people say that. They're seers in the spirit. I can see what's going on. Their faith is way out there. You start standing with God and resisting the enemy and he'll flee from you. You watch your faith start expanding. Now this requires getting dressed in the morning. Changing that stanky clothes. Getting the old. I'm, I want you guys to hear that. I want you to giggle and laugh in the morning when you get ready and like, man, that dude is crazy talking about how I'm stanky. I think I smell pretty good. Nope. And I'm gonna hear, you're going to hear me saying, get in the shower. <laughs> and get dressed. Get some Jesus on. Get some word on. Get some worship on. I'm going to get dressed today because I'm going to stand my ground. The sure foundation of who Jesus is, is my rock. Growing faith. Growing faith. In verse 17, he says, put on the helmet of salvation, or put on salvation as your helmet, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Verse 18, pray in the Spirit at all times, and on every occasion, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. The helmet of salvation. What, what, what is he saying? I went and studied, and just give me a minute longer, I want to give you this. What, what does he mean, the helmet of salvation? I went and searched and, and dug and thought, there's got to be another word, or another descriptor in, in, in a commentary related to salvation. Can I tell you that everything I can find in the English language declares salvation? Salvation in Jesus Christ, the helmet of salvation. What, what, what is the helmet of salvation? It's the renewing of your mind on the benefits of your salvation in Jesus Christ. That is the helmet of salvation. Watch it. It rules and reigns and protects your thought life. It protects your mindset. It, pro it protects the noodle bowl that you've got rolling around up there and makes sure that with the helmet of salvation, that when the enemy would try to fire his fiery darts of thoughts, right? Because we're talking about in the, in the heavenlies, in the, in the spirit realm. He's, he's throwing thoughts and things. That, nope, I have the helmet of salvation. And what does that mean? You start declaring what Christ did at the cross for you. One of them for me is, is, is uh, I quote it all the time, 2 Timothy 1 and 7. He's not giving me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. I don't have to be crazy. I can be a man full of love. I'm not fearful. Fear, fear is not from heaven. I stand in faith. I'm going to stand right, and I resist the enemy, and the Bible declares that he must go. Next, after the helmet of salvation, is the sword and the spirit. And most of us would think of the most amazing war battle with our lightsaber. Right? Can I tell you the sword and the spirit? If you study it out, in 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 uh, in one place, in um, it's John's revelation that he had in Revelation chapter one, and it declares that it, in 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 the vision that he had that there was a sword coming out of the Messiah's mouth. Some of you have read that. There's some pretty awesome stuff in Revelation that there's a sword coming out of his mouth, and then and then Hebrews declares that the word of the Lord is sharper than any two-edged sword. Dividing the soul and the spirit, bone and marrow, judging the thoughts and the intents of your heart. The sword of the spirit. What is, is that really a sword? No, we're talking about the spirit. The sword in the spirit is the word of God has now become alive in your mouth, now becomes your weapon of choice in resisting the enemy. When Jesus said... It is written to the enemy three times up on the pinnacle. He was tempted with the donut. You remember all of that I was telling you? Three times, three times. Y'all stop laughing. That's in the Bible. Three times the enemy came to resist him. And what was the weapon of choice for Jesus? It is written. 
He, he gave them the word of God. The word that is the weapon of choice is in your mouth. So some of you, we came all this way to hear this. You must take all of the truth of Scripture, get it in your heart, so that when it's time, you got to be dressed in it. Amen. you got to put off the old, put on the new. When, you, when it's time for it to come out, the weapon of choice will come out where the Lord will bring the right word in due season, the word declares, for your life and for that. The enemy will come with some kind of deception or lie, and you'll say, no, 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 it is written. Amen. No, 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 it is written. And that becomes the weapon of choice in your resistance. That's growing faith. That's growing faith. So today, hopefully, one of those you've attached your faith to, maybe all of them. But this becomes, I believe, and I was excited as it started to develop, this becomes a pretty amazing set of tools for the believer in the coming year where I believe that you're here today on purpose, that you can take these notes and literally, I don't say it in any kind of arrogant way, you can come back to these notes, the truth of God's word, and remember Get dressed up, put off the old and put on the new. Because the enemy will come, the Bible declares, at the next opportune time. If he thinks you, could live, you got your back turned just a little bit, he's coming. If he thinks you took the helmet of salvation off for just a little bit, he's going to come. And what do you do? You resist the enemy with the word of God, the sword of the spirit, and he says he will flee from you. Amen? Amen. 